Uh, this is my uh, colleague uh, Ermias Pientes from Maria. My name is Stella Christensen. I came from the University of Oslo. And in, uh, in this paper, we will talk about, uh, talk about the perspective uh, of um, in micro and macro perspective in uh, medieval coins and web solutions for that. So I will start with uh, uh, taking some uh, uh, I'll check my list again. I will start with the micro level from digitizing uh, coins found in medieval churches, and then Elmias will go to lift that to the web and to the macro perspective. Maybe you can. Uh, can yeah, you can uh, at the University of Oslo, we have a, pro a project called the Humgis. It's a three-year project, uh, and the aim is to establish an e-infrastructure for a GIS in humanities so researchers and students can uh, in a, increase the use of uh, uh, GIS data and uh, also uh, on their own data and uh, our museum is the hub in this hub node project uh, and we have arranged like uh, seminars, workshops and even GIS cafes so and underneath this Humgis project, we have this religion and money, which is a project uh, going on for some years about uh, the economy in the Middle Age. And I will go through some issues around digitizing the uh, found f uh, findings of coins in medieval churches. Um, yeah. Next. Well, we have all seen uh, this, uh, that, that our archives are, are, have lots of really nice and old documentation uh, from, from printed diaries, and maps, finding lists, etc. Uh, sometimes it gets to the archives, other times it's uh, stuck under a bed somewhere, a long way from your research. So when this pro uh, religion and money project started, I was asked if I could look at it with a GIS eyes, and if you could go next. My experience at that time was based on Stone Age excavation at our museum. Really uh, clear cut, straightforward uh, units, uh, uh, half a meter by half a meter or a meter squares, and, and uh, all finds registered to those. So it looks like this. So I was thinking, okay, this is going very well. Can I use this? Next. But then I started to look at the documentation, and it's quite a different documentation. It's old or some something from the late eighties. So it goes from uh, like this uh, 13th century church, that I mistake church in Norway, to the next one. Uh, this is from Denmark, slightly different documentation, or to this one from uh, I'd be the Newmala church in Finland, with graves, but not that much information for the structure itself. Yep, next. So, when we started this project, as you all know, we had analog uh, plans, uh, reports, black and white photos. So we started to scan the plans and we made a, a standard Excel sheet for the researchers to enter in the data and then put it into access. And then it was up uh, to, digit up the next task was to digitize the um, the, the, the documentation also in vectorizing. So if you look at this next one, which is a church of Bunge in Gotland, um, uh, we'll take a look at the plans and say, okay, uh, what to be vectorized? Everything, parts of it. Are we creating a new interpretation or the old interpretation of what actually was there? Look next. This is another church. This is a this is Arby Church in Sweden, with quite a lot of information. Should all this come to, uh, to the vectorized plans? We had ambition to do everything, but we were quite uh, early uh, thinking about it could not be a possibility. Next one, just a sample. Here, to the, your left, it's the uh, entrance from the original uh, of the church. And to the right is my uh, vectorization of it. Of course, it is, has 
uh, it's not the same, it has uh, less information, but then you have to again discuss what is the purpose of your vectorization. Is it that going is it necessary for the purpose? As for this was to to see the, the scatter uh, of the coins in the church, is it necessary to 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 be digitized in a uh, really high level for that or not? That was a big discussion during the, the project. Next. Once again, the, this the same church. One of the other big decision discussions was the hunt for accuracy. If you take the next one, please. As we see, we yeah, when you're doing GIS, as all of you do, I guess you you have to believe that you could be really accurate. But uh, this line there is just as the line on the paper is three millimeters thick, and on a scale to three hundred is already nine centimeters. So when you try to get this as accurate as you will, as you can, and also you twist and bend your the the, the your uh, your uh, raster in your GIS program. It, you will never get to an accuracy that you think you can because it's actually not possible. And on the right way, you have lost your lunch and your wife and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, next one. So then it was the lo uh, all these churches was excavated in local coordinate system. This is Ringebu, the state church. Um, and it looks really, really straightforward. You have the north and east coordinates. Uh, but then, uh, next, then I took a look at the findings list, and this is a, another church uh, which has a really nice one by one meter excavation units. The lists are perfectly from, from when it was excavated in the 80s, all looks good. But then, next, I took a look at the, uh, the, the one from Ringebu, which was excavating in the beginning of the 1980s. And uh, I saw that this is from the finding list for each coin. And you can see that, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but the, the coordinates, uh, the coordinates of the excavation units uh, goes from 0 0.02 qu quarter meters to 28 quarter meters. So I think, okay, it uh, could be really accurate and not that accurate. But then I was trying to put it on the map, and I was helped with uh, to figure it out from Sweden, my friend Håkan Torén, if you can show the next one. Because this was come up when uh, the square words were uh, drawn on, my, uh, on the computer, and there are so much overlapping uh, grids, and not structured by layers. And then I, was asked, I asked one of the archaeologists to excavate this, my old professor, and I said, well, how could you come up with a irregular like this? It's quite progressive or post-processual thinking. And he says, well, we, we dug till the bucket was full. <laughs> but so it's nearly impossible to use this for the scattered diagrams. You go to the next. So this is Bunge, and that just to show you the traditional way. This is Bunge, church, uh, 13th century, easy, uh, straightforward, one by one meter. Next. Here we have used an, uh, the, the dot density because the researchers in this project wanted to be able to see what, what that coin there has for specific information. But then, of course, these, uh, quickly came up the, the debate about what are you showing me by saying that that coin is from 14th century and that one is from 13th century because it looks like a truth, but it's not. So we have quite heavy debate about that. Next, and here we can see what I mean. You have you have the the the, uh, the old finds in behind, and then the specific coins from uh, 12, 13th century. Is this really was it really found there? And of course it wasn't. It was found somewhere in this one, but it could also if it was found underneath that nail, it could actually be from this one. But then that's a total different discussion. Uh, I was. I will have to uh, take a look at the time. Um, these were just a couple of things about, about the church finds. Uh, we have, I don't know, remember how many find churches this it is actually, but uh, Elias will now show how we can put this into a, a larger scale on the web uh, on the web based. Yes. I I will. Uh,
mostly talk about the infrastructure and the system component of uh, the GIS of the home list infrastructure that we deployed in order to make the web GIS available to the public at the University of Oslo. And uh, I will start with the main objectives of the home list uh, infrastructure, but uh, what in order it takes to create an infrastructure like the web GIS from the ground up. Then I will talk a little about the system components and the server architecture. And if we have some time, I will show a demo of the WebJS and the feature works that lies ahead. So the objective is for us, uh, to make the data, the archaeological data available in the web and to the public and to the researchers. And that is for the humanities data, not just archaeological, but other disciplines. And we do that by establishing a WebJS server infrastructure for visualization, analysis, and searching of spatial data. And at first, we have to install database uh, infrastructure, both for the vector and raster data sets. Then we have to, on the top of that, we have to install a GIS server that can serve the WMS uh, feature services in Blah, blah. And the system components of uh, the Hungis have mainly three categories the database, which holds the uh, raster and the vector data sets, the GIS mm -hmm. server, which uh, holds the uh, WMS, uh, WFS, and other uh, OGC standards and the web applications and the web maps on the top of it. And uh, after some discussion with the IT department of uh, the University of Oslo, we have decided to use a cloud infrastructure similar to Amazon Web Services, but that's open source called OpenStack that's developed by the open source community and installed in the University of Oslo and University of Bergen uh, collaboration infrastructure. And uh, this uh, OpenStack uh, uh, infrastructure is basically a virtual machine where we can install any kind of server, any kind of database, and we have control of the network and the security and everything else. And this, this is really cool for us because we have the freedom of to install whatever program that we want, we don't need to talk and discuss with the IT department every time we want to open a port or to close a port or uh, do some security analysis. And the open stack infrastructure looks basically like this. That's me at the top, the application developer. And the traditional way of uh, establishing a web server was like we have to send a ticket or an email to the IT department. Can you set up a server with uh, two gigabytes uh, RAM or two virtual CPU and some disk and open as this port and blah, blah, and a lot of bureaucracy in it. And this is usually done in the IT department by multiple people, more than three. Some of the uh, are working on the computing resource, some working on the security, some working on the networking. And basically, they just have to read that request or that ticket and try to implement the infrastructure physically in the servers. And this usually, because humans are involved in this, it takes minimum weeks, if not months. And that's a long process. But with the coming of public clouds, such as Amazon and uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, also OpenStack, we don't need to go the whole process. We just need to create some codes with some flavors and with some uh, configurations that the server can understand it and just deploy this code into the server. And the servers will automatically be, be deployed. And after that, we can install our GIS server, databases, and, and so on easily. So. Our GIS server infrastructure looks like this. It's based on S3 software, and uh, basically we have 
RPS enterprise here, which used to be called RPS server. Now it holds RPS server, which is the main powerhouse for hosting the JS data. And we have the portal for RPS, which is the local version of RPS online, with the same functionality, the same system, and we just have control of our database instead of hosting it in SS servers. And we have another system that is called RPS data store, and that holds the data sets that's uploaded uh, through CSV by people or by the public. Instead of going to the cloud, it goes to our database. And we have in the end an uh, RPS web adapter that is SS based load balancer and um, reverse proxy because we have to have some security because SS programs uh, use uh, non conventional ports such as 6080 or something like that. <coughs> And this is how our JS infrastructure looks like when we installed the JS server and all the portal for RJS and all the softwares. At the back end, we have one server for the Rector Geo database that holds the Postgres and Postgres. It's an Ubuntu server. Another one, we have uh, the same similar uh, Linux server that is Ubuntu <coughs> that holds the Raster, Raster Geo databases. And Let's communicate directly with our GIS server, that is RPS server. And all the configuration lies here in this server. On the top of that, we have one server that is a load balancer, where the RPS web adapter is installed. Also, we have portal for RPS here. And all the secure configuration is done here. And when a user logs in, he or she logs in through this one. And all our map applications and web uh, websites are like that. So I will show a demo of how it looks like. And it we have internet connection. <laughs> This is basically our cloud infrastructure. I need to log in. We use an organizational account to log into this one. When we log in, we have a list of the servers that are available, and we can just click the dialog box to create a new server. It's as simple as that. And based on that, we have installed the portal for RPS, which have RPS server in the background. And all the published maps are available here. And when I log in, I can see the list of my map services. I hope I remember my passwords. Yes, this time. It's only me who is have access to this portal because it's uh, fairly new. But we are going to connect it with our organization in login system, where users can log in and create an account automatically. And all the map contents and map services are listed on on this one. This is uh, Internet Explorer, so. I don't know how if it works well or something. But uh, based on that, we have published our maps here. Here's an example of one map that shows the confines of Norway, where we have all the information about the confines. And we, we can click here and see more information about the confines, what kind of confines we have. We have depot phone, which is called the ports or tracer finds, we have the single finds, and we have the grave finds and the church finds. These are classified according to their categories. And we have a WMS service of the old topographic map of Norway, and we have digitalized it to roads and buildings, and we can see all the buildings, the old buildings from the 1820s and all the roads, if 
we have a good internet. We can see the relationship between the robes, the old robes and the point finders. And that's basically our map portal and users can log in. You can just go in or see the data sets. Yes. Thank you.